Okay, so um, I'm going to deal with reptiles and birds and gas exchange together um, because, you know, we all know that birds are pretty much dinosaurs. That's what they are. Uh, with feathers. And then there are loads of dinosaurs with feathers coming out of uh, tar pits in China. Uh, feathers have been around for a lot longer than we think. So, <coughs> um, reptiles and birds we're going to deal with together and these are what I would call truly adapted for terrestrial existence. So, they have these adaptations for completely terrestrial existence. I don't know what you're thinking. I say reptile, you think, oh, turtles and uh, crocodiles. Well, they, they live in water. Doesn't make any difference. They are still adapted for terrestrial life. Trust me on this one. So, adapted for terrestrial life, the big key thing about living on the land is that you've got to hang on to your water. So, they're all sort of geared up for conservation of water. So if you think about our amphibians, they were doing some gas exchange over a pretty thin permeable skin. Drying out is going to be a big problem if you're going to be on land for any length of time. So birds and reptiles have an impermeable skin. In fact, if you think about reptiles, their impermeable skin is made of scales. That's, you know, that's kind of much more impermeable than that. And birds have that kind of skin covered in feathers thing going on. But it's impermeable. Uh, impermeable to water, obviously. So that's one of their terrestrial adaptations. <coughs> um, when we do the kidney, you'll find out that they uh, excrete... I'm going to introduce you to this now, uric acid. And the good thing about uric acid is it's fairly insoluble. And therefore, doesn't need water to be eliminated. Um, so that's quite a good thing. So, you know, if we want to get rid of urea, we're going to need to be carrying around a bladder of water to get rid of it in. <coughs> uh, if you're a, a bird, you definitely don't want to be carrying around a sort of balloon full of water to get rid of your nitrogenous waste in. They get rid of it in a sort of a paste, and reptiles the same. Um, now, obviously this... Particularly the impermeable skin thing gives us a real big problem with gas exchange. So how are we going to get around that? We're going to have internal lungs. And that's pretty good because that means that we... Um, they preserve our water, so they reduce water loss. And the other good thing they reduce is heat loss. So of course the key difference between reptiles and birds, uh, reptiles don't fly, reptiles don't maintain their own body temperature, but birds are lovely and warm, they are endothermic like we are, and they fly about, so they've got quite high energy demands. So we'll look at reptiles first. So, reptiles, they have lungs to increase the surface area. They have uh, Lungs are well supplied with capillaries. So 
that the oxygen and carbon dioxide circulate. Close to the exchange surface, that cuts down the diffusion path. And they have hemoglobin. which has a high affinity. And they kind of all have that. Now obviously some of the reptiles are, have other adaptations, you know, turtles for sort of being able to hold their breath a long time and, you know, slowing down the heart rate and shoveling the blood supply around to keep their oxygen. Crocodiles and alligators the same. But kind of all of them have these internal lungs, lungs well surprised with capillaries and hemoglobin. And they also ventilate their lungs. By moving their rib cage and internal organs. So effectively, uh, if you think about sort of us, we've got a diaphragm that separates out our gut and our um, internal organs, the liver, from our thorax, which is where our lungs are. But reptiles don't have that. So if they move all of their gut and liver upwards, it will push air out. And if they move it downwards, it will pull air into their lungs. Um, birds are slightly trickier. Um, they need a few more adaptations. So for birds, these are adapted for flight. And endothermy. That means making your own heat and keeping it like we do. So they have a very high, they have a much higher oxygen requirement than your average reptile. So you need to do respiration to keep warm. You definitely need to uh, do respiration if you're going to flap wings. <clears throat> Although your feathers are lovely and insulating, you've still got to make your own body heat. So, in addition to the lungs, they have air sacs. And they can supply oxygen to the lungs. So if you, again, just comparing it to what you do, you breathe in, do your gas exchange, and then you breathe out. But you're not doing gas exchange while you're breathing out, really. You're doing a bit of diffusion, you know, because there's just still some air in. And this is just a whole lot more efficient, so they're sort of, they're bringing in, they're, they're doing the ventilation. Fine movement of the rib cage. It's going through the uh, alveoli, if you like, into air sacs. Then, as they're breathing out, as in flight, then the air sacs can sort of squeeze some more oxygen back out through the uh, through the um, the alveoli and do more gas exchange. They're effectively adapted to do gas exchange at all times. Birds don't sort of hold their breath at all. They're doing it all the time. Um, and the other thing about flying um, is that we've got this uric acid, uh, which is light. I love this little phrase, light for flight. And of course they've got hollow bones, 
again a light skeleton. And of course their lungs have capillaries. Close to the gas exchange surface you've got a nice short diffusion path. You've got circulation and shock of shocks you've got haemoglobin with its high affinity for oxygen. So we've got things that maintain concentration gradients. <coughs> so in addition to large surface area and uh, short diffusion paths, we've got ventilation and we've got circulation and both of those things are going to maintain that concentration gradient over the gas exchange surface. So again, thinking back to diffusion, what do you need for efficient diffusion? You need a big surface area. Your surface needs to be permeable. The downside is it's also permeable to, be, to water. You need it to have a nice short diffusion path, so the cells are lining it very thin, perhaps just one cell. And you need a concentration gradient. Ventilation, circulation, two ways of maintaining a concentration gradient.